you've transcended a liminal threshold into history fuzz, a realm of contemplative inquiry in which leading researchers discuss the motivations, tools and skills of the sky watchers, surveyors, architects and builders who delineated monumental landscapes with awe-inspiring structures enshrining their diverse cosmic chronicles in stone. I'm your host, Ashley Cowie. You can unlock videos, maps, articles, and enjoy early ad-free new episodes by becoming a member on HistoryFuzz.com, where you can also apply to join our team exploring and filming archaeology documentaries in the Andean highlands of Colombia. Having authored over two dozen books on ancient astronomy, Professor Anthony Aveni is considered one of the founders of Mesoamerican and South American archaeoastronomy. Listed in Rolling Stone magazine's 10 best university professors in the US, Aveni has lectured in more than 300 universities around the world and has featured on countless television documentaries. In this episode, we advance our understanding of engineered Inca landscapes, as Anthony shares the functionality of the Seki system of shrines and alignments radiating from Cuzco, the ancient capital of the Inca Empire. If you're happy with it, I'm going to just come in with a question which is going to get right to the crux, open you up and from there we'll go but i'm going to ask you a key question to begin with all right i felt for the audience's intelligibility and because there are other episodes based in this landscape perhaps we could keep our discussion themed on inca astronomy and creation mythology sure and it means you can quite happily go and refer to something in maya architecture and, and go talk about stonehenge if you may but I feel if we take it back to Inca, what it'll do is give a comprehensive insight on how mythology and astronomy is merged. Okay, I think we can uh, manage that. Super. So could you give a, a broad outline on the origins of archaeoastronomy and then bringing it up to the birth of mythology and perhaps opening the audience up to creation mythology in the context of the Incas? Of course, the story of archaeoastronomy, which I define as the study uh, of uh, astronomy in all cultures of the world, ancient and uh, extant or modern, based on unwritten as well as written evidence. And one thing I noticed in your questions is that a number of them are oriented to the, uh, to the logophile. We are believers in the written word, and sometimes we don't understand these other cultures who don't differentiate between literalism and metaphor, uh, you know, with, with truth and uh, the absolute truth, and then, of course, truth that's made up for a lesson. Uh, and the more I study this archaeoastronomy and work at it, the more I realize how different we in the West, who migrated from the Babylonians through the Greeks, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment, how out of touch we are from these other cultures. So, for me, it was awakening, an awakening. I was trained as a uh, an astrophysicist and at a very early age became acquainted with these other cultures and the, the questions that have to be answered that um, often aren't dealt with by scientists who do take, take it for granted that we're, well, we're all really on the same historical path and we all look for absolute truth and we all have these stories of creation and so on. Well, I ramble a little bit. Not, not at all. And the reason I have you on is because you are one of the few educators out there who actually w visits the threshold between both, between practical astronomy and the mythological interpretation of such things. Yeah. So that's specifically why you're here. You're saying it doesn't exist. You're perhaps closer aligned mentally with a 3,000-year-old Neolithic builder in Orkney in Scotland than you perhaps think. Perhaps I am, yeah. And I think that uh, these uh, 
uh, are wonderful stories that we we deal with. And uh, you refer to the Inca case, and uh, where uh, you know you have the what do you have when you're in the in the Inca landscape? Well, what do we have in our landscape that raises the questions? about how everything was created. I'm looking out the window at snow, and I know that my whole Dan no Sawney read Iroquois neighbors and who live in these parts, and we have the reservations here, uh, used to believe in a snow monster who lived in the western region of the Great Lakes, and that's where we get our lake effect from. That's where we get the northwest wind blowing, as it is right now, and the snow moving horizontally across the landscape. Where the hell did that come from? You know, we, and, and if we talk to our neighbors, it gets traced back to Lake Erie and Lake uh, Ontario. So there's there's the basic question: What was the question? What were the questions that the the Inca were asking? Yeah, uh, uh, one of them would have been: well, What are these mountains? These huge mountains, and one of the biggest of which is Pariacaca, Pariacaca, who is the god of water and the god of snow, and he is a mountain. Uh, and he's a prominent mountain. He's a male hero. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these mountains, by the way, are uh, 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 previously living ancestors, some of them divine, some of them not. And there are wonderful stories told about men and women roaming around and doing all the things men and women do, the chase and so on. And they all become mountains. When it's all over, you don't die and go to heaven. You die and you become a mountain. And the mountains then give rise to stories, and you can tell these stories looking at the mountains. You just gave an example of an apu, a male-denominated mountain. Could you give us an example of a perhaps a rounded hill or a mountain that was associated with Pachamama or one of the moon goddesses? Can you give one? Yeah, well, there is one, and the name of which I, I don't remember, but she is inverted, uh, and it is the crotch, if you will, between the two mountains. These, these Inca were very naughty in the way they thought of things, at least by our standards. Uh, and, uh, and of course, well, Pachamama, of course, there's Pachacamac, which is an entire uh, Inca city on the coast, which is named, it's, it's a female uh, place of worship. Uh, but there, there is a mixture of the men and the women. And uh, if you go to Cusco today, and uh, I haven't been there for about 10 years now, we did much of our work uh, the anthropologist Tom Zaitama, University of Illinois, and I, uh, 10 to 20 years ago, on the Huacas, which are the sacred places, many of them mountains, uh, a Huaca can be a place of worship. We know that uh, the landscape of Cusco was divided into 328 Huacas, uh, all arranged uh, on uh, radial strings that come out from a center, just like the Andean kipu. The kipu is a knotted string device used by accountants to keep track of crops and animals and so on. Uh, and uh, if you will imagine uh, a giant uh, waka draped over the landscape, uh, it is the landscape itself that, that uh, tells it. Anthony, Let's get really nuanced here. You you are the person to answer these questions. I've been in Cusco several times myself. I ventured up to the Vilcabamba and then up to Inca Wasi, Manco Inca's last stand. And I learned a lot about the Seki system, which you've just described. Yes. Your work and Tom's work has always suggested that from the Temple of the Sun, as you just said, radial lines come out. In fact, you wrote straight sight lines to the horizon. Yeah. But other researchers, Nels, Bauer, Stanich, have suggested... Yeah, Brian Bauer in particular, yeah. Yeah, Bauer in particular suggests that they are perhaps zigzag lines between the wakas that culminate on the Temple of the Sun. But these are opposing practical efforts because to go with yourself and Tom's observation, priesthood were standing at the Temple of the Sun measuring stars and planets setting on the horizons. But the other way, mm -hmm. they sat at a meeting and said, let's identify wackas in the landscape that we deem sacred because they fall within these loose lines. So I suppose my question is to you is, what came first? The lines or the wackas? Yeah, what you're speaking about here uh, is the difference between an idealized model 
and the model in practice when you go out into the landscape. Yes. How many months in a year, Ashley? How many months in a year? How many months are there in a year? 12 or 13 if you're on a lunar calendar. They're not all of the same length. Uh, we have a 28-day month. We have 31. We have 30. Yep, yep, Ideally, yep. you could say, yes, there are 12 months in a year. But if you look at the real months as opposed to these idealized ones that we speak of as, well, more or less 30 days. Okay, I get, I'm following you. And I, and I think that the, uh, the plan, uh, see, this is a good example of the researcher taking something literally. Mm. I mean, you say when they're, uh, they go out uh, in lines from the, uh, the Coricancha uh, and you connect them together uh, and the model would be, as, as the Tom has drawn, it would be radial lines. Now, if you measure them, and I've measured them too, we mapped the, the system, we know that they're not absolutely straight lines. Okay. You might have to say, let's say, this is going to be such a good waka for this second. We've got to include it, uh, even if we have to go 28 feet or, or meters off the line. Anthony, do you think that was what was in the mind of the priests? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I think that. You do. Right. Just as we say, I live near the Erie Canal. There's the Erie Canal. It's straight. Now, I can take you to a place where the Erie Canal is a little bit crooked, but we idealize it as straight. So it's the model versus actuality. And I have no quarrel with Bauer over this, although he seems to insist that it's, okay, I can't say that it's a straight line. Um, the question really is, is what was in the mind of the Inca priesthood that were at the Coricancha temple delineating the landscape? And yes. here's a question then. Are there any examples of wakas on the horizon marking the astronomical lines to the horizon that you suggest? There are, but uh, people often mistake the visual line of sight as being along a seque. Uh, uh, usually it's between huacas on different seques. Okay. So, for example, the um, uh, sunset on the June solstice goes from a huaca of one seque to a huaca of another seque, aligns with the Pleiades. Wow, and then people would come there. For that event. Oh, yeah, they would come there just as they go on pilgrimages today. You, I don't know if you've ever been on the pilgrimages that goes up uh, the um, uh, the river uh, to, um, to uh, Lake Titicaca, which was the place of origin. That's where the Inca were born, in that lake, and they came here through caves under the ground. That's another story we can get into. Yes, we certainly do, but let's keep the mythology. What, what I'm loving here is that a really good look at the Seki system because you are really ironing out questions that I've had for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I tended to think Tom's work stepped over the Wu line, perhaps, and this is a modern interpretation, yeah, sure. but which was actually made up or comprised in the landscape of individual localized wackers that were switched on and switched off with different archaeoastronomical events and then maybe were left alone for another season. Yeah, astronomy was a, only a part of it. I mean, I uh, we've looked at a lot of these. They're not, they're, they're, particularly it's the solar extremes okay. that they're paying attention to. And we have pretty good documented evidence, that the pillars uh, on the horizon and so on, uh, that they were incorporating the calendar in that system. How was mythology associated with the individual wackas or perhaps the system as a whole? How did it work phenomenologically for the Incas? Well, it, it had very much to do with the ayllus, A-Y-L-L-U is the word, uh, that, that uh, lived in and worked in the environment of Cusco. One very clever social arrangement that I don't know nothing about anything like it in our own culture, is that there were these kin slash work groups called Ayus uh, that tended to the Wakas. That is, they went to the Wakas. Particular members of these Ayus went to particular Wakas on particular days and made particular offerings. It was a very rigid uh, system. It often involved people from the southeast, Suyu, the four divisions of Cusco called Suyus, going from that uh, Suyu to the opposite one on the other side. Really? That would be a little bit like my 
my uh, uh, coming to uh, being required to go to not my neighbor's house to help to shovel the snow, but rather to a neighbor on the other side of town. Now, when you stop and think about that, that's a system for integrating uh, social affairs, isn't it? It's forced pilgrimage. But they lie at the center of the Seke system uh, with the four suyus, Kunti Suyu, Anti Suyu, and so on. And then the groups of some 80, 90 wakas, whatever it is, per zone. Um, and then the formula for how they move around. Some of that is told in Batanzos and other descriptions of the Seke system, uh, but not in a lot of detail because the Spaniards didn't understand this, this way of socializing. Where I live in Colombia, the Moisca creation mythology is very similar to the Incas, and at their chief temple of the sun in Sogamoso, which Spanish records say had more solar priests in attendance than Mecca. Mm-hmm. Archaeologists in the 60s found a north road, a south road, and an east and a west. And they found tunnels following these roads loaded with artifacts. One example was a life-size golden cat with emerald eyes. And they found the mummified shaman of the priests of the sun. But that temple was located because on the winter solstice, the sun sets behind Laguna Iguagi, which is the lagoon associated with the birth of Bachwe, the creation goddess. Do you see significant mountains, lakes, shrines associated with creation mythology in the Seki system? The calendar that we studied there was a very practical one. Okay. I mean, if you're going to schedule movements of Ayus, uh, from one to another on certain days to give certain certain offerings, you'd better have the practical part. This was in your first question. Sure. The practical aspect of the creation story. When exactly is that date? Uh, and that's why we start the year with this observation of the Pleiades over one of the wakas as seen from another on different second lines. Uh, and that begins the 328-day year uh, 328 being the number of wakas that are described by the, the more, the most prominent believable chronicler. Uh, so you have these days and they, and they, that begins then the first cycle of the year and you go uh, all the way around through the pillars, uh, sunrise and sunset at each of the solstices. That would be four horizon points, uh, ending the count. And then you leave the remaining days, that would be 365 minus 328. 37. Uncounted time. It's like the five days at the end of the Aztec or the Maya year. They're just not counted. And we have a lot of trouble with that. In Spanish accounts of Moisca Colombia, when they were describing the Moisca's lunar calendar, there was an additional death month, a month with no ears, and this synchronized the lunisolar calendar. That's what you're explaining, isn't it? You have to intercalate. You have to intercalate. And so this practical calendar is built in. Uh, I mean, to answer your question, I don't know of any uh, elements of the creation myth that are incorporated precisely. And I notice one thing that you like to look for is precise stuff. Okay, let's discuss that. Uh, and I always tend to push that a little bit aside because precision isn't as important to these cultures as it is to ours. And of course, we want to be like them. That I'm not accusing you, but I, but I would say that we like to be like them or have them be like us. Why? It makes us feel more secure. Yeah. So, Anthony, let's discuss that. I think it's a really interesting point. You're right. I talked with Dr. Robert Weiner, who studies the Chaco Canyon for Boulder, Colorado University. Yeah. And my question to him was, how does your tendency to creating duality get in the way of your understanding? Oh, yes. Wonderful point. Where have you found in your career, Tony, that your tendency for looking for dualities and accuracy has got in your way of understanding an animistic culture in which the whole was perhaps more important? Well, uh, yeah, we do it because the Bible tells us so. You know, you start with good and evil and then man and woman. They always get their compartments, and that, and uh, and I think that's a Western. I'm not saying no other culture in the world co-opts it or has it, 
but I think it's a very Western way of thinking. And I have my own doubts about the Chaco phenomena. I mean, once you get one phenomenon, you get another one. Interesting parallel with Stonehenge. If you find a solar alignment, what do you do next? You look for a lunar alignment. That's what Jerry Hawkins did. That's exactly what they do in Chaco and a lot of other places in the world. And I'm not saying there aren't any lunar alignments, but we seem to follow uh, what I call the Tom paradigm, T-H-O-M. I wrote a piece about that in a book edited by Clive Ruggles uh, and how we carry that over into our own research. I try to avoid it as much as I can. The Tom paradigm, did you call it? The Tom paradigm after Alexander Tom. So let, let's get in there. In archaeoastronomy, it has to do with if you find the solar alignment, you look for the lunar alignment. And um, if you comb the ruins of Mesoamerica, you'll find somebody out there with a surveying equipment looking for that lunar alignment because that, that, that's what you're going to find. Do you argue the existence of that famous lunar alignment at the lunar maximum at Boulder Rock, is it? Just north of the Chaco Canyon, there's a famous Casas Grandes that has the Boulder Rock mountain behind it. And every 18.6 years, the sun rises between the two tops. Uh, yeah, well, I'd like to know how many rocks there are, how many measurements were made. You got to do this. You got to use the statistics. So how many don't have that alignment around it? That's right. That That's correct. I mean, in the in Mesoamerica, we have the advantage of, of architecture. I mean, I have a building at Ushmal that I know is aligned to Venus. I can be reasonably sure it's aligned to Venus. Because long after I measured it being aligned to Venus, I was embarrassed to find from an art historian uh, that the text of uh, uh, above the doorway has Venus symbolism in it, even has dates that tell us where Venus is. What date? When was it? Which part of the eight-year cycle? 800 AD. But the part of the cycle was the uh, southern uh, turnaround, the extreme southerly limit of Venus. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is quite different from the lunar alignment. It's not that. Uh, uh, so here you have iconographic evidence supporting it, and you have written evidence in the glyphs as well. So you have to use, you have to look for corroborating evidence. Okay. This is so interesting. When I've listened to so many of your talks, I thought you were going to be far more insistent on accuracy to try and support work but you're like modern archaeoastronomers have interviewed and what they say is when we look at a google earth or a data set in your case we're looking at that with a modern digitized point and line linear based thinking process and then when you get out into the landscape and look at that alignment it's like you've arrived on the moon tony there's no familiarity it's a different thing altogether how do you find that Tony? because you've been on the field you're not like an armchair archaeologist you spent a lot of time in Cusco didn't you indeed, indeed. yeah well you have to have some precision in the alignments but I think that most scientifically trained people um, are guilty of what I call precisional overkill uh, they spend so much time uh, worrying about the precision that they don't think about corroborative evidence that might be, well, let's say in the iconographic record. But then, of course, the scientists will say, but I'm not an iconographer. I'm not an art historian. Well, then you ought to damn well work with an art historian. And that's one reason why I've published a lot of joint authored papers. I mean, I consider myself to be the, te the technician out in the field with the surveyor's transit with a modest knowledge of the disciplines that impinge upon the one in which I was originally trained. But I also uh, uh, li want to listen to the word of, you know, well, you know, maybe even a humanist now and then. Sure. Uh, and that's not something that uh, the scientist does. Um, it's all about precision. A humanist can't be attributed a number in a spreadsheet, can it? <laughs> yeah. And of course, that's part of the Tom paradigm as well. It's uh, the murderous <laughs> exactitude and precision in numbers, but not much help. I'm going to give you a beautiful example to illustrate what you've just said. Dr. Robert Barrett in Queen's University, Belfast, approached the 23 Neolithic temples built 3,700 BC on the island of Malta. He took them all as a data set, and archaeoastronomers generally say they were not aligned to the solstice because they're mal aligned by 7 degrees this way, 8 degrees this way. He reapproached the data set and noted that when you're at the centre of the temple, 
visually sitting there looking out, the portal frames 10, 10 or 15 degrees on the horizon. Yeah. Identifying a period of time between early November to early February. Therefore, what he's shown is true intentionality in a period of time, which means there was deliberate archaeoastronomy within the structures, whereas the people obsessed, as you say, with the Tom paradigm are, are dis dismissing the solstice importance because they're looking for one day or one azimuth. Well, actually, that's a, that's an, that's a perfect example of what I mean. And I, I, I agree. Uh, I don't know this work, but uh, it, it does make sense. I mean, isn't that good enough for planting and I celebrating a market and so on. I mean, does it really have to be the solstice is this Thursday? As one of my colleagues said, well, we can't celebrate till 10 p.m. because it isn't until 10 p.m. But yeah, but it's solst it's sort of solstice -y. You know, that's the time of the year. So I'll publish, I'll, I'll celebrate when it's convenient on that day or maybe even the next day. Uh, you know, we're going to celebrate Christmas on Monday, are we not? Is it, is it fall on Sunday? Or is it Monday? We can't remember. Hey, Tony, we always say about the Moiskas in Colombia, the rec records of their celebrations went on for days. I think they were celebrating the three days of the standstill. Sure. Boricero and Joppo last for three days if you're proper intoxicated. So I think it was a definitely a, a three-day celebration on the solstices in the Andes. Sure. I mean, I think they don't think of time the way we do. I mean, we've got the femtosecond. We've got things down to a femtosecond, and even that's not good enough for us. So naturally, we tend to look for this exactitude in others because we have it. Uh, and I think that gives us some justification for our own existence to know that other people behave the way we do. Got to be careful of falling into that trap. Right. I'm going to now switch this whole conversation because you have given us such a good broad outline on what we could generalize as Andean astronomical considerations. All around the Andes, there are creation myths that begin with the insertion of a staff, generally golden, in a location or a territory. So could you outline Inca creation mythology from Titicaca up to the founding of Cusco? Well, when I uh, talk about, as I do a chapter in my creation stories, I have a chapter on the, the creation myth. Uh, it really uh, consists of a story about caves. Uh, because in, the, in that book, I've divided all the chapters according to the nature of the landscape. I mean, people who live in the middle of the ocean, like on the island of Japan or Hawaii, have myths that relate, wonderful, fabulous myths that relate to the water, to the straits in between the islands and so on. Okay. Uh, and uh, with the uh, Inca, as we already stressed earlier in the discussion, it's all about mountains and it's about caves because there are caves there. So the story goes that the creation happened in Lake Titicaca where the uh, Inca were instructed to descend into the earth coming out of the waters of that lake mm -hmm. uh, into an underground pathway. We don't say which one it is, but an underground pathway that would take them ultimately to Cusco. And there's a location in the environment of Cusco, we may even have been there, where one of the, is it Patayacta, or one of the caves up above um, Cusco on the north side, I believe, where this is where the guide will tell you, this is where the first Inca came out. They came out from the underworld having journeyed all the way here. And of course, then we, as modern celebrants of the source of our creation, are compelled on the June solstice to go up uh, and a river that takes us directly to that lake. Uh, and there's the great pilgrimage that takes place around the time of the solstice with thousands of people going along that route back to where their ancestors came from. So there's beautiful closure to that myth, but it does involve the earth features, the caves and the mountains, which is what you see. And of course, make the story easier to tell to young folks because there's the mountain right in front of you. You can see Pariacaca, you can see all of the named mountains and the role that they played in this drama. From the Rock of the Sun. Yes. Yeah. Now, as to penetrating the ground with a staff, here's another one of my biases. We are a culture. I mean, I can't stress how misunderstood Columbus must have been when he encountered the Tainos 
planted a staff in the ground, in this case, a Spanish flag, and said, I claim this territory. Mm. Ownership of territory was unknown to every race of being, as far as I understand, in all of the Americas. Uh, they, uh, the, the Tainos didn't understand what he was talking about when he claimed this land, because the land is not owned. It's not owned by anybody. Um, and, but interestingly enough, here's a question about putting a golden staff in the ground uh, to claim land or to claim that this is where it started. This is the point at which it started. I'm not sure I believe it. Uh, I don't know where the story comes from. So it's hard for me to address it. But they appear all over the Andes here. Bochica, the sun god, relieved the Moiscas from a flood by cracking us. Do you know what this is, Anthony? I'm about to tell you the story of Moses. Yes, that's right. But before you do, I, I have to say, I have to back up and suggest that is it not quite possible that that Moisca myth may have been a product of colonial imperialism? And there are dozens of myths that come from the Americas that are pure and simple European. And, and what else do you do with a story? I mean, a good story has to have uh, a life where it goes on. It has to be capable of being extended. I mean, there's nothing like a good storyteller who knows how to make mythic substitution, mythic substitution. Mm -hmm. There's a marvelous example of it that I have to tell you about since we're talking Inca. Please do. Do you know about the Yama and her baby? The dark constellation. Yeah, the dark cloud constellations. Yeah. Well, there's the, 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 the baby suckling. Uh, and uh, outside, back of the tail of the Yama, is the fox, who is the predator. And he's waiting for the mother to take her attention away from her cria uh, so he can eat the baby. I mean, talk about predator and prey. That myth travels all through the Andes. A, the Yama is being pursued by the fox. If you go a little bit south into the Amazon region, the jaguar takes the place of the fox and the deer takes the place of the Yama. Deer has the long neck, just like the Yama. But if you go even further south into Tierra del Fuego, the predator and prey switch places. The predator becomes the dog, uh -huh. and the prey is a rhea, which is a relative of an ostrich. It has the long neck, so the prey is reversed. So, I mean, uh, we might be asking, if we knew nothing of this, is how, how come uh, the animal that's chasing the other animal is uh, uh -huh. not the same? They must be lying or making it up. Now, heaven only knows what that myth can turn into after the colonial period. Yeah. So I always am a little bit concerned about cultures that are picking up just wonderful stories uh, told by wonderful storytellers who know how to switch the bait uh, to keep you interested in it. But so there's a myth that's pan South American may even cross over into Panama, for all I know. Going back to, to Vera Coach's role in Inca creation mythology, he's described as a white-skinned, bearded god with a shawl on and a staff. Mm -hmm. Bochica of Colombia is a white-skinned, bearded god with a book and a staff that came from the East. Yeah. Both of them are associated with not having educated the indigenous people, but having civilized the indigenous people. And I think I think therein lies evidence for what you've just said, because perhaps you can do it, but I can't. If anybody said to me, go and show me an artifact from Moisca, Colombia, depicting the god Bochica, doesn't exist. Yeah. He has never been worshipped as a white skinned, bearded man holding a book and a staff like Jesus Christ, essentially, or a mission, a missionary or a monk being projected. It's wonderful. It's wonderful propaganda. I mean, it, uh, it serves the benefits of the colonizers, doesn't it? But it's all we've got to refer to. No, it's not. I was going to say we've only got the Spanish written records in which mythology has been warped, but we don't because you are essentially saying an, a fully readable book exists in the sky every night for us to see what they believed. Yeah. 
we discovered, and I don't even think we published this yet, but uh, oh, good. I had a, uh, so you're going to scoop it here. Uh, I had a visiting uh, archaeologist from the um, Catolica Lima. Oh, yeah. And we were talking about the Yama. We have a big planetarium here. We call it a visualization lab to make it sound more fancy. And uh, we said, well, let's look at this Yama. There she is going around. He pointed out to me that in the uh, uh, one of the mythic books, the uh, Huaro Chiri myth, which is a pretty well published by Frank Solomon, very, very good translation is, uh, that uh, they say that uh, when the Yama drinks water, when the Yama reaches down to drink the water, uh, then uh, the rains will begin. There you go. So we decided to move the Yama. Let's see when she drinks the water. And we switched her all the way over to the west, put her head right on the horizon. The date was November the 1st, give or take a week, which is the time when the water runs in the canals uh, on the coast. People who live on the coast would look up at the mountains. They'd see all the dark clouds. A few days later, the water runs in the canals. So there's truth in that part of the myth. Yeah. Him and his Quesada arrived in Colombia in 1537. He must have just clapped his hands and said, thank you, Lord, when he realized the beginning of the wet season falls here on Holy Week. Mm. Mm. How nice. So what a tool of conversion. No longer do the rains that sustain you come from your pantheon of gods, those diabolical ones, but it all happens because of Easter. Yes. Isn't that such a fortuitous thing for a conquistador? Well, and, and of course, it's an excellent way to transfer the myth from one culture to the other. And um, and we have evidence of this throughout Mexico as well. With the oh, I was going to ask you here. I do lots of research in the alignments between population centers, the trade routes, and then the ceremonial roads of the landscape here. When I want to plot Moisca temples, I plot the oldest colonial churches because they were generally always built on the shrines of the Moisca. Yeah. Do you find the same pattern there where you have modern churches built over prominent Inca shrines? Oh, absolutely. I have a study that is going to be going to be published shortly in a homenaje to David Carrasco. Okay. Where we uh, measured the axes of some three dozen churches in Xochimilco. Oh, really? Uh, that's just a district of Mexico City. And they are indeed aligned, uh, not only, not all of them, but the ones where we have evidence of something underneath. He aligned, aligned quite precisely with the ancient temple. But also there are lines of sight that go to some of the markers that we studied in Teotihuacan namely the pecked circles, you know, the double circles with the cross in them mm -hmm. that incorporate astronomical considerations into the arrangement of Teotihuacan. So here we have a joining of the two landscapes, the, 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 uh, that of modern Mexico and of the ancient tribes and, and, and manifested in the churches. Okay. Do you think the church builders were aligning the churches with those ancient sites, or do you think they were aligning their churches with significant astronomical occurrences on the horizon, which are on the same axis as those sites? Well, what would make the most sense, of course, would be to align them to the site uh, with the sites, because then it's a continuity, it's a continuation of the culture and the religious belief, and the Christian could be satisfied by saying, oh, well, you just got the wrong Jesus. You know, you just didn't have the right God. Oh, wow. But we do have some examples, such as you suggest, where there are alignments to important objects on the uh, on the horizon. Wow, really? I'm trying to think of whether I've published that or not. But Tony, what you're saying there is that the church delineation, orientation, and alignment was a tool of conversion. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the example I can think of that we do have, and we have it in three churches in Highland, Mexico, is the um, orientation to the constellation of the keys of St. Peter. Look it up. Now defunct. It's a defunct constellation. But the doorway of the church 
is not is not only aligned with the building, but also with the place where the constellation of the keys of St. Peter rises. And moreover, on each of the three churches, there is sculpted on each doorway the keys of St. Peter. I mean, there are the keys, keys to heaven. Oh, my goodness. That's like you finding your strip of text with the Venus symbol at the portal. We, yeah, I see the same thing you do. Yes, yes. Yeah. What I'm going to do is formally thank you, Tony. Because do you know what we just did? We covered the Seki lines, and I'm absolutely delighted to get you coming on and showing me exactly how you think it was built and how you think it worked functionally, especially for that. Well, you're the you're the guy that runs the podcast, and you do it very well, I must say. Uh, gently moving your perhaps too talkative guest <laughs> from one topic to another, but it's been a pleasure. This is probably the first time you'll see a lot of your colleagues with slightly differing points of view. Yeah, well, that's... And do you know what you're all pointing towards? Every one of you. 30 years ago, everybody was accuracy focused. Yeah. Now the masters have stood back from that and they're like, oh no, the edges are blurrier. It's branched out, a little more complicated. The study of culture is a little more complicated than the empirical stuff we're, we're used to. So thank you for bringing us together. And hope to see you again. Tony, it's been great. Thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, drop a five-star review or share it with a friend. And you can get in touch with me through HistoryFuzz.com.